you don't want this overflowing, super overpopulated gut bacteria. That's not the goal, okay? And a lot of just health experts out there will kind of lead you to believe that, that you just want a bunch of gut bacteria. That's not what's important. What's important is the diversity of the species and, and how it's placed throughout the colon, how it's placed throughout the intestinal tract. That's what's important, not the overall number. We want diversity, and that's gonna be a common theme that I talk about within this video. But another thing that you're gonna see come up a lot within this video, just fair warning, is lipopolysaccharides. So I'll touch on that for just a second. Lipopolysaccharides are little guys that ride on the bacteria within our gut. Okay, they're supposed to be there, but a lot of times in bad situations when we're unhealthy, these lipopolysaccharides get into our bloodstream and trigger a lot of different issues. Okay? They are seen as a pathogen because from an evolutionary standpoint, our bodies have evolved to see the gut as a completely separate ecosystem from the body. We are a host for these bacteria and there's two separate worlds living there. So I just want to lead in with that before I dive into this science, talking about the four worst things you can do for your overall gut health. Hey, I do want to make sure you hit the red subscribe button and then please do hit that bell icon so you can turn on notifications whenever I post a new video, which is every single day. So please make sure you hit that red subscribe button. You won't be disappointed. All right, let's first talk about sugar. Sugar is a terrible thing you can do for your gut, but don't just take my word for it. Let's talk about some science. There's a study that was published in the journal Immunology. It implied that sugar created biofilms. What the heck is a biofilm? Well, biofilm is something that surrounds bacteria and makes it more resilient. Now, you may be thinking at first, well, this is great. I want my bacteria to be more resilient, right? Not necessarily. Our gut biome has a natural circle of life, and that bacteria in there needs to abide by that, right? It should live and die the way it's supposed to, like nature intended. But when we have these unnatural biofilms that form, it basically makes the bacteria numb and it makes it so they don't react. They're less reactive to other things. So sometimes good bacteria eat bad bacteria and vice versa. But if they're protected in a biofilm, you're disrupting the natural cycle of this bacteria, which throws things off. Now, biofilms were first discovered in the medical community when you started looking at like uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria, because a lot of times they will form a biofilm to make themselves resistant to the antibiotics. You can see how this could be a big problem just in a natural cycle. Fun fact, I will say, I know this uh, from other research and from my wife having Lyme disease, that stevia does seem to break down biofilms. There's nothing concrete that shows that, but I will say that stevia does help contribute to the breakdown of these biofilms. So you could have a gut benefit with stevia, but that's a total side note. Let's get back on track. What I think is more important is a study that was published in the Nature Scientific Report. This took a look at sugar and found that sugar decreases the gut diversity, okay, the bacteria diversity. This, in my opinion, is a big problem, okay, because you're left with just a specific kind of bacteria and not just the wide variety that you need. Here's a little example for you. If you have uh, a tribe and this tribe only has one kind of weapon, right? Okay, there's a hundred of them, but they can only use their fists. Well, they're gonna be effective because they've got some numbers, right? But compare that to a tribe of maybe 50. And these 50 people each have different weapons, okay? So one has a fist, one has something else. Which one's gonna be more effective? The 50 with the diversity of weaponry or the 100 with just limited diversity? arguably probably the 50 with the diversity. Our gut is just more effective when it's diverse. So when sugar affects our gut diversity, we're causing a pretty serious issue for ourselves. Now, there's other things that happen too. It's not just the gut diversity. It also decreases what are called short chain fatty acids. Now to touch on this briefly, short chain fatty acids are what veggies are broken down to, it's what uh, butter and things like that are broken down into, and they feed the epithelial cells. They feed the cells within our gut whose job is to grab nutrients and bring it in. So with lower levels of short chain fatty acids, one could argue we have just an inherently weaker gut. But here's where things are really wild. It was found that after consuming sugar, immune cells were very, very active to lipopolysaccharides. What this simply means is two things. Right after consuming sugar, we potentially have more lipopolysaccharides crossing through the gut and into the body, which is terribly bad to begin with. But not only that, we have a heightened immune response to the lipopolysaccharides, meaning our immune system in essence is overreacting. This contributes to chronic inflammation, but it contributes to pretty much a, just a full scale attack going on in your body shortly after consuming sugar. And it all is stemming from the gut. This next one is one that's not talked about enough, emulsifiers. 
Okay, I'm not talking about like some natural emulsifiers that are really just harmless. I'm talking about pretty serious emulsifiers. Some of the things that like polysorbates and things like that. Okay, there is some interesting research, but let me just break some stuff down really quick. What is the job of an emulsifier? It's to break down a fat, right? It's to break things down. Well, does an emulsifier belong in your gut? Not really. I mean, think about your mucosal layer. It's like if you put an emulsifier into your gut, it's going to start to emulsify your mucosal layer in theory, right? That doesn't sound like a healthy thing to begin with. Well, the journal Science published a study that implied that, yeah, it does actually affect your mucosal layer. In fact, when they gave mice emulsifiers, they found that their gut bacteria ended up being 50% closer to the epithelium. So let me give you a visual here as to what that means. You have your intestinal tract, and then you have your epithelial uh, cells, okay? Your epithelium. Well, you should have a barrier from your bacteria to your epithelium, and that barrier is your gut mucosal layer. So the way they measure the mucosal layer is how far is the bacteria from the epithelium? Well, normally it's gonna be yay far, right? Well, if the gut mucosal layer breaks down, the bacteria is gonna be closer. So when they noticed that the bacteria was sitting nice and snug up against the epithelium, they knew that the gut mucosal layer was breaking down. What's interesting though, is that emulsifiers that were given to germ-free mice, mice that had no bacteria, okay, they're just altered to have no bacteria, they had no effect on their mucosal layer. Now, you may be thinking, what the heck? Well, what that implies is that the emulsifiers are having a stronger effect on the gut bacteria, not just the mucosal layer. So what's even more interesting is the mice that had the emulsifiers, they took the bacteria from those mice and they put them into other mice well, those other mice ended up acquiring the same negative attributes as the mice that consumed the emulsifiers. They had more inflammation and all kinds of other issues and, a, you know, glucose, uh, basically intolerance, things like that. What that shows us or demonstrates is that the issues are coming down to the gut microbiome. So the emulsifiers are affecting the mucosal layer, but more so they're affecting the little bacteria within our gut that are so, so, so important. You're going to find emulsifiers in so many different pantry foods and processed foods and stuff like that. This is a good spot for me to mention one of my awesome sponsors, Thrive Market. There's a link down below in the description for you to check out Thrive Market. They're an online membership-based grocery store that specializes mainly in like pantry goods and stuff like that, but they're very health focused. So I've created different boxes like hormone optimization boxes, thyroid support boxes, keto boxes, fasting boxes, all things that I would recommend getting from a grocery store that you can get delivered right to your doorstep. So I do highly recommend that you check them out. They're a big support of this channel, one of the best ways that you can support me and my team and the content that we're creating is by supporting Thrive Market. So please do check them out down below in the description after you watch this video. It is relevant, but I'm also not saying that anything's gonna fix anything. I'm just saying, if you want good clean pantry items, I highly suggest them down below. Okay, now let's jump over to one that's gonna disappoint you. Artificial sweeteners. All right, stevia, monk fruit, good to go. Okay, let's just get that out of the way. But please, please exercise caution with saccharin, with aspartame, and with sucralose, okay? Here's some interesting science to back this up. The journal Nature published a study that demonstrated that artificial sweeteners do negatively infect the gut bacteria to the extent of which they affect glucose tolerance. Basically, our bodies were still seeing the artificial sweeteners as sugar. So it was still affecting us and making us glucose intolerant. Now, in a similar setting to the emulsifier study, they took the bacteria of the mice that were fed uh, artificial sweeteners, and they took that bacteria and put it in other mice. Guess what? those other mice ended up becoming glucose intolerant too. It is what the artificial sweeteners do to our gut bacteria that is the problem. Okay, let me say that again. It is what the artificial sweeteners do to our gut bacteria that is the biggest problem. Forget everything else, forget the toxicity and all that. It's what it does to our gut bacteria. Well, since I brought up toxicity though, let me reference a study that was published in the Journal of Chemical Toxicology. Okay, it implied that when artificial sweeteners are consumed, it triggered liver inflammation. This doesn't really come as a big surprise because the liver is responsible for essentially filtering everything that's coming out of the gut. So if it's going into the gut, it's going to end up going into the liver. So if we have something that is semi-toxic or toxic at all, the liver's gonna pick it up and it's gonna become inflamed. But I hope that you haven't tuned out yet because this is where stuff just gets extremely wild. The negative effect on the liver is mediated by actually altering the gut biome. So what that means is, if you have artificial sweeteners coming in, yes, you could say it's affecting the liver because it's toxic, but if the gut biome is corrected and fixed, 
then it doesn't cause the problem. So what we're actually potentially seeing is a downstream effect negatively affecting the liver, not because the artificial sweeteners are toxic, but because they negatively affect our gut bacteria, which is negatively affecting our liver. Mind blown. Our own liver can be treated, our own liver can act as though there are toxins in the body simply by a result of what is happening to our gut bacteria. Wow. The last thing that I want to cover is something that's a little bit ambiguous. It's the world of trans fats. Now, from a metabolic standpoint, from a fatty acid metabolism, from a CIS bond breakdown, all that stuff, trans fats are bad and we know that. But it seems to be that they're causing a problem within the gut biome too. You see, we're seeing when people consume or, or animals consume trans fats, they have a huge dysbiosis. They have less in the way of bacteroidetes and more in the way of some of these other bacteria. Now, the reason I'm not spending a lot of time on this one is because we don't really know why yet. Trans fats are hydrogenated, they're, they're altered. We don't really know how they're responding within the body. We just see, for one reason or another, they cause bad bacteria to grow. Probably because bad bacteria thrive on bad things. I don't know, honestly, it's not very scientific, but I'll leave it at that, okay? So sugar, emulsifiers, artificial sweeteners, and trans fats. Those are your four total demons when it comes down to your gut health. I'll see you tomorrow.